Hello, I'm Pastor Reed Ellis at River of Life Worship Center here in Blue Earth, Minnesota. And the coronavirus is changing our lives substantially as we're all finding out more and more day by day. The stay-at-home order by Minnesota Governor Waltz has ex been extended to May 4th, which is three more Sundays. And because of that order, our church has taken the proactive step of not having services on Sundays to protect our parishioners. We have made you a YouTube channel for our church, and if you go to www.youtube.com, you can go in the search bar and type in Blue Earth River of Life Worship Center. And you can subscribe to our channel so that it's easily available to you. On that channel, we'll keep posting sermons for each week so that they are available to you whenever it's convenient for you to watch them. We will post them each week sometime during the day on Saturday. If you do not have the technology available to you to watch these videos, please call me at 507-369-4322 and we'll make a device available to you. This is the second week that I've included two playlists on our channel, a pre-service playlist with songs relating to the sermon message today and a post-service playlist of one song and the Bible Project video overview of Zechariah that you can watch after the sermon message. So click on the playlist tab on the Blue Earth River of Life Worship Center YouTube channel to access those extra features. We ask that you continue to send your tithes and offerings to the church by mail or drop them off. Our mailing and physical address is 1329 South Ramsey Street here in Blue Earth, Minnesota. And if you have prayer requests, please call me at 507-369-4322 and I will place those prayer requests on our prayer list. If you desire, I will send them on to our prayer team as well. So let's take a look into God's Word today as we return to our sermon series called God Speaks. Hello church and welcome to our April 19th Sunday series message, God Speaks. We're returning today to this series of messages on the things that God has spoken directly to man throughout the scriptures. We started with Genesis and have just about completed the Old Testament. What is God speaking to his children through his ancient words spoken through the prophets of old? I will review this week the March 15th message before the coronavirus and the Easter series. But next week I will not do that as you will be able to go back and watch the prior week's message on our YouTube channel. So let's quickly review the book of Haggai, the one that we covered on our March 15 service. The author was Haggai, and his name means feast or festival. Now this may indicate that he was born on a feast day, one of Israel's special religious holidays, such as the Passover or the Feast of Tabernacles. He is one of the only three prophets who ministered to the returning exiles in Jerusalem after the Babylonian captivity that lasted 70 years. Zechariah was Haggai's contemporary. And while Zechariah focused his message on the spiritual temple of the future, the Messiah's coming kingdom, Haggai focused on encouraging the returned exiles to rebuild the actual physical temple there in Jerusalem. Both prophets challenged the people to be faithful and devoted in service, making the Lord first priority in their lives. The date that Haggai was written was the year 520 B.C. He delivered his four messages 16 years after the first group of Jewish exiles returned from Babylonian captivity. No other Old Testament writing is as precisely dated as is Haggai. The prophet dates each of his messages to the very month and day that they were given. It was written to the exiles of Judah who had returned to Jerusalem to rebuild the temple of the Lord. 
Now, approximately 50,000 exiles had responded to the proclamation of liberation by King Cyrus. The first group arrived in Judah around 538 B.C. So the purposes of the book was written, first is the historical purpose. Haggai preached with a singular purpose in mind, that of challenging and encouraging the Lord's people to complete God's work. The Lord himself had given the returned exiles the task of rebuilding the temple that had been destroyed by Babylon and its armies. Tragically, the people allowed many distractions to get in their way. The doctrinal or spiritual purpose of the book is brief. There are three great lessons that stand out. First, that disobedience to God is a frequent cause of believers' struggles. The people were not being blessed because they were neglecting the work of the Lord rather than being diligent and persevering. The people had easily given up and begun to pursue their own interests. Secondly, and similarly, that the Lord must come first in our lives. Just as God gave the returned exiles a special job to do, God has given every believer a special task here on earth. We are called to walk closely with the Lord, to trust Him, and to put Him first in our life. Doing God's will must be our top priority. Matthew 6.33 says, But seek ye first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Thirdly, we must believe in, cling to, and hold on to God's promises throughout life. No matter how faithfully we walk with the Lord, we will still face hardships. Jesus said, in this life you will have trouble. Difficulties then are a part of life. They're part of this broken world that's been damaged by sin. God allows hardships then to test us, to strengthen us, and then to draw us nearer to himself. Still, we must persevere and never, ever give up. The Christological or Christ-centered purpose of this book is Christ is foreseen in the great book of Haggai in several key verses and special promises that the Lord gave his people. Christ is the desire of all nations, the one who restores glory to God's temple, chapter 2. Christ is the conqueror of the kingdoms of this world, chapter 2 as well. Christ is the signet ring of the Lord. And I think this is an interesting concept uh, for us to think about and meditate on. What does that mean? He's the ultimate servant of God and ruler of God's people. So let's take a look then. We figured Haggai. Now let's take a look at the introduction to Zechariah. Zechariah was authored by Zechariah. And his name means the Lord remembers. And is shared by at least 30 other men named in the Old Testament. Like Haggai, his contemporary, and Malachi, who prophesied about 90 years later, Zechariah ministered to the returned exiles living in and around Jerusalem after the Babylonian captivity. He was born in Babylon, and Zechariah was one of approximately 50,000 exiles, as I would mentioned before, who returned to Jerusalem in 536 when Cyrus declared that they could do that. They were led by Zerubbabel, the governor, and Joshua, the high priest. Zechariah was the son of Berechiah and a grandson of Edo, both of whom were priests. This means that Zechariah was also a priest in addition to being a prophet, like Jeremiah and Ezekiel before him. The date written was somewhere between 520 and 479 B.C. It is likely that chapters 9 through 14 were written later in Zechariah's career. This would account for the different style of these chapters as compared to chapters 1 through 8. Zechariah's first messages were delivered to the remnant living in Jerusalem, 
right after their return from Babylonian exile. He dates these messages, including the eight nighttime visions in the second year of Darius's reign. So year 520 and 519 B.C. Haggai was preaching a similar message of repentance and encouragement at the same time as uh, Zechariah. The messages of chapters 7 and 8 are dated in the fourth year of Darius' rule, while the prophecies of chapters 9 through 14 are not dated. These messianic prophecies are believed to have been received much later in the prophet's life, perhaps as many as 40 years later. It was written, of course, to the exiles of Judah that had returned from Babylon. They had returned to Jerusalem to rebuild the temple of the Lord. That was their priority when they left. But 16 years later, they still have not built the temple. So the book of Zechariah is also written to people of every nation and generation, reminding us of our first responsibilities, our responsibility to God. So let's look at the purposes then for Zechariah. The historical purpose is this. Zechariah delivered several types of messages, and each one with distinct purposes. His first message was a call to repentance. The people needed to return uh, to God from all sin and wickedness. If they were going to be used by God to build his temple and to inherit his promised blessings. Unless the people obeyed the Lord completely... They would be passed by and judged just as their forefathers had been. God had world-changing plans for them. Plans to bless them and through them to bless the whole world. Prior to this taking place, however, the people needed to learn a valuable lesson from former generations, their ancestors. They needed to return to the Lord wholeheartedly. Only then would he return to them and bless them. So this call to repentance prepared the people's hearts to receive the wonderful promises revealed later in the book. Now the next messages were startling revelations of God's working behind the scenes of history. In a series of eight visions, all received in one night, Zechariah was given amazing insight into how God had orchestrated world events to bring his people back to the land of Judah. And of course, we know one of those was God putting on the heart of a foreign king, Darius, to tell them to return. This, uh, these messages were given to encourage the people for their immediate task at hand, that of rebuilding the temple. Now, following eight visions, Zechariah delivered four more messages meant to challenge and encourage the people further. These are in chapters 7 and 8. Now, first, he reminded the people of their former dead religion. In prior generations, the people had practiced empty and heartless traditions without any concern for obeying and truly living for the Lord. And with that in mind, the prophet reminded the people that their religious rituals are meaningless if their hearts are not devoted to God. Neither was the Lord pleased with their rituals and worship if the people did not treat each other with justice and compassion. So we see faith without works then is dead. And that's basically what he was speaking to them, something that the, prophet, uh, the apostle James talked to us about. Now, after this critical reminder, the prophet revealed several promises concerning Israel and the temple, and these are contained in chapter 8. God first gave assurance that the present generation would indeed complete the temple. Next, the Lord promised future blessings for Jerusalem, blessings of prosperity, security, and God's personal presence in that temple that they had rebuilt. In addition, one day in the future, people from all the nations of the world would flock to Jerusalem to learn the ways of God. Now these last promises were obviously uh, messianic and spoke of the distant future when Jesus would return to earth again. Nevertheless, they encouraged the people 
and with the heartening revelation that Israel's future was truly going to be glorious. Zechariah's final two messages included astounding and detailed prophecies of the Messiah. One message prophesied of the people's rejection of the Messiah at his first coming. The second message described his return as a king. At the Messiah's second coming, he would judge all nations and establish his kingdom on earth. In that day, the Lord will be king over all the earth, chapter 14, and everything will be cleansed and holy unto the Lord. These prophecies of the Messiah strengthen the people in their work of rebuilding the temple because the Lord had wonderful plans for them and for all of God's people through the future and eternity. The second purpose is the doctrinal spiritual purpose for the book. Three teachings dominate and unify this great book of Zechariah. The prominence of the temple in the life of the future restoration of Israel just as the tabernacle was the center of all the life of the Jews as they left Egypt and went to the promised land, it was built right in the center. That was the purpose of it being a center to all of Jewish life. The, providence, the second thing was the providence of God in bringing back his people to the promised land after their exile in Babylon. And you'll notice all three of these are P's, a great uh, sermon outline. And the preeminence then of the Messiah in Israel's future restoration. And then the salvation of all nations and all peoples of all time. The Christological or Christ-centered purpose is this. The book of Zechariah is filled with prophecies concerning the Messiah. In addition, Christ is specifically portrayed as the righteous branch, the one who removes sin from the land in a single day, chapter 3. He's also mentioned as the crucified Savior, the one pierced by his own people who will be mourned by his people when he returns. He's also mentioned as the betrayed shepherd, the one betrayed, amazingly, for 30 pieces of silver. He's also mentioned as the coming king, the one who comes riding on a gentle donkey to proclaim peace to the nations. He's also mentioned as the triumphant king, the one whose rule will extend from sea to sea, who will destroy Jerusalem's enemies and who will cleanse his people from all sin and all unrighteousness. He's also mentioned as the judge of the nations, the warrior who gathers the nations and Israel's enemies for judgment, chapter 14. And lastly, he's mentioned as the angel of the Lord who commands other angels, the one who takes away the sins of Joshua and all of God's people. So let's take a look at a few select texts from Zechariah. Zechariah chapter 1, verses 2 through 6. The Lord was very angry with your forefathers. Therefore tell the people, this is what the Lord Almighty says. Return to me, declares the Lord Almighty, and I will return to you, says the Lord Almighty. Do not be like your forefathers to whom the earlier prophets proclaimed, this is what the Lord Almighty says. Turn from your evil ways and your evil practices. But they would not listen or pay attention to me, declares the Lord. Where are your forefathers now? And the prophets, do they live forever? But did not my words and my decrees, which I commanded my servants, the prophets, overtake your forefathers? Then they repented and said, The Lord Almighty has done to us what our ways and practices deserve just as he determined to do. Zechariah chapter 3. Then he showed me Joshua the high priest standing before the angel of the Lord and Satan standing at his right side to accuse him. Now the Lord said to Satan, 
The Lord rebuke you, Satan. The Lord who has chosen Jerusalem rebuke you. Is not this man a burning stick snatched from the fire? Now Joshua was dressed in filthy clothes as he stood before the angel. The angel said to those who were standing before him, Take off his filthy clothes. Then he said to Joshua, See, I have taken away your sin and will put rich garments on you. And then I said, Put a clean turban on his head. So they put a clean turban on his head and clothed him white uh, while the angel of the Lord stood by. The angel of the Lord gave this charge then to Joshua, who was the high priest that had returned with them. This is what the Lord Almighty says. If you will walk in my ways and keep my requirements, then you will govern my house and have charge of my courts. And I will give you a place among those standing here. Listen, O high priest Joshua, and your associates seated before you. Who are men symbolic of things to come? I am going to bring my servant the branch. Notices in caps referring to Jesus Christ. See, the stone I have set in front of Joshua, there are seven eyes on that one stone, and I will engrave an inscription on it says, that says, The Lord Almighty, and I will remove the sin of this land in a single day. In that day, each of you will invite his neighbor to sit be, uh, under his vine and fig tree, declares the Lord Almighty. Great prophetic messianic portion of scripture. Then in Zechariah chapter 4, Then the angel who talked with me returned and wakened me. As a man is wakened from his sleep, he asked me, What do you see? And I answered, I see a, a solid gold lampstand with a bowl at the top and seven lights on it with seven channels to the lights. Also, there are two olive trees by it, one on the right of the bowl, the other on its left. And I asked the angel who talked with me, What are these, Lord? And he answered, Do you not know what these are? Well, no, my Lord, I replied. So he said to me, This is the word of the Lord to Zerubbabel. Not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord Almighty. What are you, O mighty mountain? Before Zerubbabel, you will become level ground. Then he will bring out the capstone to shouts of, God bless it, God bless it. Then Zechariah chapter 9, verse 9. Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout, daughter of Jerusalem. See? Your king comes to you, righteous and having salvation, gentle, riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. Zechariah chapter 12. This is what the word of the Lord concerning Israel, the Lord who stretches out the heavens, who lays the foundation of the earth, and who forms the spirit of man within him. This is what he declares. I'm going to make Jerusalem a cup that sends all the surrounding peoples reeling. Judah will be besieged as well as Jerusalem. On that day when all the nations of the earth are gathered against her, I will make Jerusalem an immovable rock for all the nations. All, to try, who, all who try to move it will injure themselves. On that day, I will strike every horse with panic, and it's rider with madness, declares the Lord. I will keep a watchful eye over the house of Judah, but I'll blind all the horses of the nations. Then the leaders of Judah will say in their hearts, the people of Jerusalem are strong because the Lord Almighty is their God. Now we're going to transition to our Bible project video. It's titled Overview, Zechariah. It's copyright protected, protected August 1st, 2016 by the Bible Project and are available for viewing at www.bibleproject.com. The book of the prophet Zechariah 
The book is set after the return of the exiles from Babylon to Jerusalem. And we're told in the book of Ezra that Zechariah and Haggai together challenged and motivated the people to rebuild the temple and look for the fulfillment of God's promises. Now long ago, Jeremiah the prophet had said that Israel's exile would last for 70 years and that afterwards God would restore his presence to a new temple and bring his kingdom and the rule of the Messiah over all nations. The dates at the beginning of this book tell us that those 70 years are almost up. But life back in the land was hard and it seemed like none of these promises were going to come true. Why? And the book of Zechariah offers an explanation. It has a fairly clear design. There's an introduction which sets the tone for a large collection of Zechariah's dream visions. And that's concluded by chapters 7 and 8. And then this is followed by two more large collections of poetry and prophecy. Let's just dive in and see how the book works. It begins with Zechariah's challenge to his generation to turn back to God and not be like their ancestors who rebelled and refused to listen to the earlier prophets, which landed them in exile. And so now the returned exiles respond positively to Zechariah. They repent and humble themselves before God, or so it seems. The next large section is a collection of eight nighttime visions that Zechariah experienced. And just to prepare you, these are full of very bizarre, strange images, a lot like your dreams. The idea that God communicates to people through symbolic dreams, it's very old. It goes back to the book of Genesis. The dreams of Jacob or Joseph or Pharaoh, these gave meaning to current events at the time, but they also gave a window into the future. And so Zechariah has his own dreams now, and they've been arranged in this really cool symmetric design. The first and the last visions are about four horsemen each. They're like rangers patrolling the world on God's behalf, and it's a representation of God's attentive watch over the nations. Their report is that the world is at peace. And in Zechariah's day, this refers to how God raised up Persia to conquer Babylon and bring peace. And so the question now arises, the 70 years of Israel's exile are almost up. Is now the time for the messianic kingdom in Jerusalem? And God responds by saying that he's determined to fulfill those promises, but he leaves the question of timing unanswered. The second and seventh visions are paired because they're both reflections on Israel's past sin that led up to the exile. So the second vision is about these horns that symbolize the nations that attacked and then scattered Israel, Assyria and Babylon. But then these horns or empires are themselves scattered by a group of blacksmiths, an image for Persia. The seventh dream is about a woman in a basket, and we're told that she's a symbol of the centuries of Israel's covenant rebellion. And then this woman is carried off to Babylon by other women who carry the basket flying with stork wings. This is so strange. The third and sixth visions are paired as they're both about the rebuilding of a new Jerusalem. So a man is measuring the city. It's an image of God's promise that Jerusalem will be rebuilt and become a beacon to the nations who will join God's people in worship. And then the sixth dream is about a scroll that flies around the new Jerusalem, punishing thieves and liars. The idea being that the new Jerusalem is a place that's purified from sin by the scriptures. The fourth and fifth visions are at the center of this collection, and they're about the two key leaders among the returned exiles. So Joshua, the high priest, and then Zerubbabel, the royal descendant of David. So Joshua had been symbolically wearing Israel's sin in the form of these dirty clothes, but then those are taken off and he's given new clothes and a new turban, a symbol of God's grace and forgiveness. And then an angel tells Joshua that if he remains faithful to God, he will lead his people and Joshua will become a symbol of the future messianic king. The other vision is about two olive trees that supply oil to this elaborate gold lamp, which itself is a symbol of God's watchful eye over his people. And these two trees symbolize the two anointed leaders, Joshua and then Zerubbabel, who's leading the temple rebuilding efforts. And God says that success will not come to this new temple if it's the result only of political maneuvering. Rather, these two leaders must be dependent upon the work of God's spirit. The visions come to a close with a bonus vision from the prophet, and it picks up the themes of the central fourth and fifth visions. It's Joshua, the high priest again, and he's given a crown and presented as a symbol of the future Messiah, who will also be a priest over God's kingdom. And then Zechariah closes it all out, saying that all of these visions will be fulfilled only if the current generation is faithful to God and obeys the terms of the covenant. 
And so altogether, these three visions emphasize how the coming of the Messianic kingdom is conditional upon this generation being faithful to God, which leads to the conclusion of the dreams. It's another challenge from Zechariah, and a group of Israelites come, and they've been mourning over the former temple's destruction for nearly 70 years. And they ask him, is it time to stop grieving? I mean, is God's kingdom going to come very soon? And Zechariah again reminds them of how their ancestors rejected God's call through the prophets, which led to the exile. And so he challenges them too. He says, this generation will see the messianic kingdom only if they pursue justice and peace and remain faithful to the covenant. So in other words, Zechariah reverses their question. He asks, are you going to become the kind of people who are ready to receive and participate in God's coming kingdom? And that question is left just hanging there. The people don't answer, and the book just moves on. And so we come to the final sections that are very different from chapters 1 to 8. Each section is a kaleidoscopic collage of poems and images about the future messianic kingdom. So the first one, chapters 9 to 11, describe the coming of the humble messianic king who's riding a donkey into the new Jerusalem to establish God's kingdom over the nations. But then, all of a sudden, this king, he's symbolized as a shepherd over the flock of Israel, and then he's rejected, first by his own people, but then also by their leaders who are also symbolized as shepherds. And so God hands Israel over to these corrupt shepherds, and it raises the question, will Israel's rejection of their king last forever? In the final section, chapters 12 to 14, say no. It's another mosaic of poems and images about the future messianic kingdom, and they depict the new Jerusalem as a place where God's justice will finally confront and defeat evil among the nations. It's very similar to the same themes in prophet Joel or Ezekiel. But then God also will confront the rebellion within the hearts of his own people. He's going to pour out his spirit on them, he says, so that they can repent and grieve over the fact that they have rebelled and rejected their messianic shepherd. The final chapter concludes with the new Jerusalem as the gathering point for all of the nations. And then this city becomes a new Garden of Eden, and there's a river of living water flowing out of the temple, bringing healing to all of creation, and that's how the book ends. And so Zechariah just leaves you to ponder the connection between chapters 1 through 8 and 9 to 14. And the point seems to be that this future messianic kingdom of the book's second half will only come when God's people are faithful to the covenant, the point of the first half. Reading the book of Zechariah is a wild ride. These visions and poems are full of startling imagery, and they do not follow a linear flow of thought. And that's part of the point. It's like history and our lives. It doesn't always fit into neat, orderly patterns. But the prophets offer us glimpses of God's hand at work, guiding history towards his own purposes. And so ultimately, Zechariah invites us to look above the chaos and hope for the coming of God's kingdom, which should motivate faithfulness in the present. And that's what the book of Zechariah is all about. So God speaks. Words of challenge to us. Just as he has spoken to every generation that has ever lived, will you be a faithful generation? Secondly, God speaks, reminding us of the failures of our ancestors, showing us where things went wrong. I believe he gives us this knowledge so that we can learn from history, learn from the past, so that we, instead of failing, can be successful. God speaks. Yeah, I see the failures in your life. But if you will just commit to me and my son, Jesus Christ, there is resurrection, transformational power, to be a faithful generation. Wasn't that what we celebrated last week? So the question for us today is the same question that the prophet Zechariah asked the children of Israel. Will you and your generation, will you be faithful? And if you're faithful, you will see the victory. This powerful song, See the Victory, is in the post service playlist for today. And please listen to Elevation Worship Team. They're worshiping. Sing it after my closing prayer today. Let's pray. Father in heaven, I just thank you 
that you are a God who challenges every generation to live a holy and godly life. Just as Zechariah challenged uh, the people of his day, I'm challenging the people of our day, Father. And it starts first of all with me. Will Pastor Reed be a faithful servant of God? But then that message spreads out for me into our church and to those who are outside of its walls. Will we, this generation living in America today, will we be a faithful generation to God? So Lord, I think you've given us a pause in our society. This coronavirus has given us all time to kind of sit, get out of our regular schedules, and to contemplate this exact thing. What has been important to us? What have we been pouring all of our efforts into? Have they been God's plan for our life, or have they been my plan for my life? Lord, thank you for reminding us today through the prophet that we must choose our path today. And if we choose wisely, oh, there's blessing and victory. But if not, there's failure and defeat. Help us choose wisely today. For it's in the name of Jesus, our Lord, our Savior, our triumphant King that we pray.